everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited you're here with us today because we're going to be talking about something that Sherry Quam Taylor and I agree. It's kind of mysterious. Like, do you do it or you don't? And that's the case for support. So we're going to drill down with our amazing guest, Aaron Straza, to figure out what the heck is going on and what kind of tool this is. So ladies, we've got a lot to talk about, so we need to get into this. Okay. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by Sherry Quam Taylor, CEO of Quam Taylor. Sherry's one of our intrepid co-hosts, and so we are thrilled to have her with us today. Our, our co-hosts come from all over the country. They work in diverse parts of our sector. Um, brilliant, brilliant thought leaders. And so it's wonderful to have you with us today, Sherry. Welcome. Thanks for having me as always. Yeah, a lot of fun. Again, we have amazing sponsors and I want to make sure that we shout them out. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new episode just dedicated to fundraising issues every Friday and 180 Management Group. These are the people that support us day in and day out. Well, I am really excited to have uh, my colleague and friend, Erin Straza, who is Chief Donor Strategist. Uh, you can find her website right there. But um, here's why I'm super excited, not only because I like Erin, uh, <laughs> but to have her on the show today because um, it, it is a little bonkers, Julia, you, you brought it up, that there is this mystery around a case for support. What is it? Uh, do we really need it? Uh, is it a brochure? Is it an external? Is it internal? So Erin is going to uh, dispel all of those myths and tell us exactly what it is. But I want to what I want to say about Erin is uh, the reason my clients love Erin is because she has this uh, ability to work in this magical intersection of donor communications, uh, mm -hmm. fundraising, and she has an MBA. And so you know, how do we actually message to major donors? How do we, you know, how do grassroots donors respond to us? So she's, uh, it's just this magical uh, kind of, I think, angle or, or lens that Erin has that um, that's been really fun to watch. So Erin, um, I'm so glad you're here on the show with us. Well, thank you both to you and Julia. Thank you so much for inviting me to the conversation and to talk about one of my favorite tools for nonprofit teams. I love talking about case for support. It is, really just, it is magical, but it also uh, is something that is sturdy as a framework. Mm -hmm. It's not all magic and mystery. It really is something that's solid. And once you understand what it is and how to use it, it really does transform. So good. So, okay. So even, you know, when I talk to clients and I say, do you have a case for support? <laughs> I get kind of wild answers to that. Oh, so yeah. lay it down, Erin. What is a case for support? How do you use it? Start us at the top. Well, first of all, you get wild answers because everyone has a different different definition of what it is. And so I'm going to tell you what my definition is because this is how I think of it and how I use it. So your case for support, it is a narrative. It is telling your nonprofit story. It's being told for the donor. So yes, you are doing work as a nonprofit, but your work is only possible because you have partners and those partners are your donors and also other constituents. And so you want to widen that circle and say, this is what we are doing together. And that story needs to be written as a full narrative, something that you know from front to back, um, and there are pieces of that narrative that will be consistent year after year after year. And so with that consistent message, it really does help everyone on the team and everybody externally to understand what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Why are you a nonprofit and why, why is donor support so essential? And so this narrative how I think of it is as an internal tool. So you mentioned, Sherry, is this a brochure? Is it something else? It will be, yes. <laughs> but initially, this <laughs> is a tool. And tools are, are utilitarian. You use them to build other things. And mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's an internal document. And when I say it's a document, I really do mean 
it's a it's a word doc it's a google doc it's pages and pages of words but it's all written in narrative form that you could read from start to finish and it's telling your nonprofit story so um that's kind of high level overview and then there are pieces of a case for support that i can also explain um there are some standard elements that go into a case for support um but before I just dive right into that, I thought I'd pause a minute and see, are there any other questions about that? And what else can we say about just that structure um, and the use of it? Yeah, so me to uh, clarify. Go ahead, Julia. No, I'm fascinated by this because I don't see this being used enough. Um, oh. and, and so it's really an interesting thing, but mm -hmm. I've got to back the bus up and say, is this done when you're just starting out or is this done before you have a capital campaign uh -huh. or you're going into the next decade, whatever the heck, like <laughs> how often should we apply this tool yeah. to the whole ecosystem of our nonprofit? Well, I see this as foundational. I don't care where you are. If you don't have one, you need one stat. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And how I see this case for support, this becomes your core document um, to create all other documents. It's the one doc to rule them all, if you want to think of it that way. Like, this is the thing you're going to use to create specific communications. So okay. this is going to be um, kind of like your, your cornerstone of all words, all communications. Mm -hmm. you, you write it once. And I would say, because of how it is written, how I help clients write it, it is something that is going to stay pretty standard for years. Um, okay. Not that you won't tweak it, but this becomes the core document that you then create specific creative briefs from for a capital campaign. You can create your annual report out of it. Um, you can create a specific um, funding campaign out of it. So this becomes sort of that touchstone that everything else comes out of. Mm -hmm. And you write it once, it's hefty, it covers the whole org. That yeah. doesn't mean you'll never need creative briefs, but this <laughs> becomes the overarching piece that defines your yeah. org and all of its programmatic work. You know, one time we were on a call and Aaron described it as the sourdough starter. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like pull a piece off. Let it off, <laughs> and then you build on it. Yeah. And so you know, and I, and I love that. And I was like, I, that has stuck with me because yeah. I need a LinkedIn post, pull from the case. I need yes. website copy, pull from the case. I need campaign collateral, pull from the case. The root and the the you know the original starter of the sourdough is the case. Yeah. I love I'm, that analogy. I'm fascinated by that because, ladies, the first thing I think of is like, wow you put a little bit of effort, a lot of bit of effort, let's mm -hmm. say a lot of bit of effort. Yeah. And then you have something that you, when you're moving forward, you just grab from and it, it can go a lot faster from grant writing to, exactly. as you mentioned, communications, annual reports. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. That narrative is fully formed. What a, what a gift. Mm -hmm. Every team that I've worked with, they've come back and they've said, oh my goodness, this is all going so much more quickly in terms of content development. We all know how much content mm -hmm. is needed in a nonprofit um, organization. There are just so many things you need to say and things you need to communicate to all the constituents. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who need to say something. And this yeah. gives everyone guardrails. It gives everyone something to work in, in terms of a language and it all is echoing off of each other, building on each other in terms of all the phrases and the words that you're using. It really gives everyone a square one and it helps all those communications to build and be integrated. I love it. I yeah. love it. Well, let's get on to the next issue and that's defining the problem statement. Mm. Talk to us about that because yeah. this is a uh, is this along the lines of mission or is this moving into a deeper uh, piece? It is mission plus the deeper. So um, in a case for support, it starts off with a crisis section. So it can be your problem, your issue. It's the reason why your org is functioning because there's something in the world that's not right and you want to change it. So mm -hmm. that first section of your case for support is the problem section, the crisis section. And 
I like to um, build that out with all of the key facts and figures that the organization typically refers to. All the outside sources that say, this is a problem. Here's the stat. Okay. This is why this is a crisis. And so we write that with the stats in there in narrative form. And that way, no matter who is in your org that wants to talk about the problem, they're like, oh, here's the stat. I pull it out. I've got it sourced. It's all ready. Very little um, need to then go and find other sources in the moment. Now, those sources, I do see that orgs will often check those about once a year to say, oh, do we still want these sources? Do we have new sources? You can always add more in. Um, but you want to go deep here. I, interestingly, I have had some nonprofits say, Bo, but we don't want to focus too much on the negative, on the problem. Mm. And um, what I have found is that if you aren't highlighting what needs to be changed, then donors don't know what the urgency is and they don't know why should they care enough to actually partner with the org. So um, I find the crisis to be essential and something that's often downplayed or ignored. Mm -hmm. And what I also like to say is the case has four sections. You have a lot to say, and you're not going to only talk about the crisis. But if you never talk about the crisis, people don't know why they should give to you. So you need to have that as part of your communications regularly. Yeah, this is where fundraising is education. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, I mean, we, we find so often that fundraisers are setting down and even that donor who's been giving to you for years, yeah. Uh, you know, when you're starting to use, you know, statistics or a story that kind of weaves those statistics in is incredible to me how many donors say, oh, I, I didn't know that. Or, wow, that really that percentage of people are illiterate in whatever like they do yeah. not know. And so fundraising is education and we can't just tell the flowery change live story. That's important. We have to tell uh, the story of the problem we're solving, how how we're solving that, and then and then also you know that the investment level story and why people should give to it. So it's critical. Wow, I I love that you uh, wove this in that way because I think you're right, Sherry. I think a lot of times people, even board members, if you go all the way up, will be they think they know everything about what's going on, but then you'll you'll be be in a meeting and something gets mentioned and they'll you can tell they're kind of shocked like totally. they didn't really know. And so yeah, this is a fascinating discussion. Wow, what an amazing tool. Mm -hmm. Um let's move on to impact evidence and that factor and what is it? I mean, you've already talked to us about we need to be, you know, data specific and have our mm -hmm. metrics and have those outside voices supporting, you know, the the drive that we are embarking upon. Mm -hmm. Talk to us more about this impact evidence. When I think about the impact and how that's woven into the narrative, you want to give donors the sense that when they give something changes, that mm -hmm. their gift is actually moving the needle on whatever that crisis is. And so when you connect the crisis to yes, this is bad, but we have the solution. And then when you come in, this is part three, when you come in as a donor, we see these sorts of changes and now we can achieve the outcome and the vision for the future. So providing donors that sense that when they give things change, um, that helps the donor to feel like it is worthwhile that their mm -hmm. gift is wise, um, that they are actually partnering with you and making a difference in the world. And so you need those um, impact metrics connected to your case for support. Now, depending on um, your programs, your number of programs, whether you have those stats embedded in your case, or if it's something that, oh, this year, for each of our programs, we're seeing these metrics, you'll need to have that um, woven into the overall narrative that you are talking to donors over the course of time. Um, but giving them that sense of my dollars are doing something and accomplishing something, and especially connecting it back to the stories of lives changed, that just makes such a difference for donors. It's so inspiring to them. It is. And I'm going to, you know what you're highlighting to me, Erin, mm. I can tell when a person doesn't have a case for support or fundraisers mm. because, you know, you're describing something that is talking about the overarching mission. Why should you yeah. give general operating dollars yes. for our overall <laughs> mission? 
And so if someone doesn't have this, if they struggle to articulate the overall yeah. crisis and solution, and so what do they do? They go straight to, so could you fund this project at 25K? Yep. Or could you yep. restrict yep. it to this? Because they don't know what else to sell. Right. And so that is such, if you know people are hearing this and saying, oh yeah, because then I just pulled together a project for people to fund. Um, this case helps you lead donors to the broader mission, a broader understanding and an unrestricted gift, which is a game changer for most organizations. Yeah. I love what you just said. And it kind of gives me the chill, Sherry, because I think this is like the perfect example of chasing the buck. Yes. You know, starting this, like it's, you know, sometimes we call it mission creep, but, but starting this path where you see the dollar signs, or it might be a grant, it might be a, you know, a more prosperous donor who has the funds to turn over something grand. Right. But right. then we kind of divert our attention. It's that shiny object yep. that all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're yeah. looking at. So mm -hmm. really, I, I think that's like, wow, this case for support needs to like get moved up on all of our desks and, and how we're doing this. Okay. Let's go to the next question. And, and, um, this fits in along with Sherry's comment. And when we talk about defining our funding needs, mm -hmm. should we be more specific to like where Sherry said, you know, maybe it's this program's going to cost this and this year's going to cost that, or, or should we be more general in how we're expressing mm -hmm. our financial situation? When I develop case for support statements, um, everything is written to um, how does the donor understand their partnership and how it meets that budgeted need. Um, okay. What that phrasing is and the specifics on those dollar amounts, I put those in other tools because again, the case for support is going to be pretty firm and solid year after year. So if you put okay. anything that's time specific in there, then you're just going to have to update it every year. So if you think of your case for support as a messaging guide and narrative, then what that does though with your budgeted need and, and identifying what the investment levels might be, that's something that would come into, let's say a campaign brief where you're saying, oh, for this year, we're looking for these dollar amounts to support these programs, however many programs you might have. Um, and you can then develop specific asks and um, and invitations to each of your donor groups based on what that budgeted need might be. Um, I don't tend to put those right into the case for support, but those are usually also being developed as we're working on the case for support because all of this fits together. The whole goal of that messaging guide is so that donors understand how they can invest. So it's all part of it, but I don't tend to put those budgeted numbers right in there. Okay, Sherry, I gotta ask this question. You, when you work with clients across this globe, how many people have this tool and, and have it in this mm, way? That's a good question. Uh, Rarely. Uh, even when I, I ask for it, uh, I said, can I see your case for support? I'll get a brochure. Um, I'll get a uh, their last foundation proposal. Um, and so it really is a tool. And it's a tool that every organization needs. And it actually is the tool that is keeping people from mm -hmm. A, raising to their overall need and B, raising enough unrestricted revenue. Because uh, it really is painting that broader, um, broader picture of funding, but it also is educating donors and helping them understand why an overarching mission-based general operating gift is the most impactful. Um, you know, then clients can learn how to use that and guide conversations and the whole mm -hmm. thing. But mm -hmm. um, rarely do I see people come with this. You know, the other thing I'll say is like sometimes uh, I, we've talked about it like. You know, people have their uh, brand guide. Here's our logo. Here's how we use it. Here's the space. It's, you know, it's it's color 7272 purple. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of the the messaging version of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's I rarely see people come to the table with this, but it is a it is a core tool that organizations need. I think because that um, like a a fully designed, beautifully printed out booklet is what we tend to see as the external audience mm -hmm. 
that is outlining the pieces of the case for support, we think, oh, that is the case for support. And I always say, oh, there's something else though. <laughs> Before there was a printed piece, somebody had to write all those words and that was in a word doc. And so again, if you think of the case for support as the end result, um, that's just the brochure that's highlighting <laughs> the case for support. And there's probably a 20 page narrative that is feeding all of that content and driving the development and the design of that key piece. And so you need the key piece for sure, but with that case for support narrative in place, then it makes the development of that piece so much simpler and anything else you want to create is going to echo it. So I have found that donors really, um, are able to digest the message better when it is said the same way over and over and over again. You know, it gets yeah. old to you because you hear it all the time and you live in it right. when you are in the nonprofit. But right. um, donors need to hear it over and over and over again, the same sort of message in a lot of different creative ways, but you need to have that consistency mm -hmm. so that they can digest it and see what is their role in this mission and that they are a vital part of the outcomes that you are trying to drive to solve that crisis. Do you know what the other key here is, Erin? You've kind of said it without saying it. A case for support is very hard to do internally. Hmm. You have to have yeah. objectivity from the outside to say, yeah. well, you're saying it that way. You're using acronyms. You're talking in industry yeah. language, but donors don't understand what you do. Yeah. So I'm telling you, you have to have an objective writer uh, expert, professional, t like mirror back to you and come outside and say, oh, oh, so you do this? Yeah. <laughs> it is number one. And and again, it, that's where it's like, you gotta, you gotta spend money to make more money. Um, hmm. It feels like, but wait, we know our program so well, how would someone put that in that language? That That's the point. It has to be translated into that objective donor language so that they understand what you do. Nonprofit teams are so busy and so swamped and they are doing a gazillion things every day. And it's so hard to decide, but which of these gazillion things does the donor need to know? And so then as an objective yeah. outsider, I can say, well, I've just now come to know your org and your mission, and I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm going to help you sort through all those pieces and, and help you to understand, here's what I think that the donor is going to need to know, what's going to help them mm -hmm. Um, connect to your mission, connect to you and feel like they understand the big picture. They don't need to know all the granular. So this also keeps you out of the weeds in your communications. And so that donors feel like, oh, now I know what you do. I, I can't tell you how many clients I've had where they say, donors don't even know what we do. And it's like, yes, because you're overwhelming them with all the little details. And it's like, let's, mm -hmm. let's give them the big picture, stay up here, um, you know, 30,000 foot view and help them to understand the overall movement of the mission, mission not the every day, here are all the tasks and yes. to do's that the nonprofit is busy doing every single day. Okay, so then let's, we don't have that much time left, but let's boil it down. Um, if we're going to go secure an outside professional to do this, how much is this going to cost and how much time should we allot? Mm. And then what should we be doing? in terms of the follow-up and keeping it fresh, I mean, as opposed to just starting all over. I mean, right. if, can you give me those those three kind of touch points so that we can understand how to invest in something like this? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I tend to take about three months, two to three months. Okay. Um, three is ideal, two is pushing it, but it can be done uh, to work with a client on this initial piece of creating the case for support. So it's a lot of interview time. Um, it's a lot of back and forth work, collaborating on that narrative, um, helping the team to get their words in order and to focus on the different pieces of that case for support narrative. And mm -hmm. so, two to three months just to get the narrative down. And then after that, it is implementation. And mm. typically I like to work with clients, again, another nine to nine months. So 12 months in total is ideal just because it gets you through the whole communication cycle 
of mm -hmm. how do we use this case for support? Because it's it's terrible to invest in a tool and then it sits on the shelf. That's that's the worst. Yeah. And to start over every time, like, oh, mm -hmm. what a waste. No, no. Like, let's take what you have and get it in order and then implement. Now, as far as investment goes, um, did you have a question about that, Julia? Yeah, I'm just like, and I'm, I'm, you know, I really pride ourselves on the nonprofit show that we're, we're not like a sales webinar. So sure. I'm asking you to kind of give us a range. And I realize that yeah. in in Los Angeles, it's going to be a different right. price than New York. Than and depending Miami. on the person. And the yeah, uh -huh. I think this is such an interesting level of investment. It's not like a one and done. Um, right. I, I'm fascinated, you know, this looking at it as this three month piece, but yeah. then it gets it worked time. for another nine yeah. months. Yeah. So like a, kind of a big range, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it is a big range. I mean, yeah. some will write a case for support for a couple thousand dollars. It can go up into 20 to 30 K just depending okay. kind of like um, branding work. If you think of it that way, right. like brand kits are going to cost a couple thousand to 40,000, who knows? Yeah. Um, but yes, it is a big range. It all depends on the person. Um, but just so that nonprofit teams know you're going to probably spend a couple months working on it and mm -hmm. it's going to be an investment, but it is something that you will use long term. Mm -hmm. So that's the bonus. I mean, if it's done well and done right, it's something that you have then to be used, I'd say for three years straight, um, maybe with minor tweaks and then maybe on year three, maybe on year five, go back and take a look at it again. So it's kind of like working on your website. It's a lot of work up front, but then it's working and it's running and everyone likes it. And then eventually the tech changes and you're like, ah, we got to change this up. So a little bit like that. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Sherry, I know that you and I have spoken and when you've co-hosted, um, the case for support has arisen, but wow, I just feel like I've gotten hit in the head big time <laughs> to realize like, this has got to move up. This has got to, this issue and this thought has to move up. It's got to move up. It's one of those blocks. You know, yeah. we've talked about we have to, donors aren't going to give their best gift if there's a block in the way, if there's something they don't understand. And so I think people should really pause and say, you know, why aren't why aren't donors growing their gifts or why am I not attracting that next level donor? Um, oftentimes it's because they're simply confused about the problem you're solving and what you even do. Um, it, it seems so simple, but it it's pretty wild. Um, how even when my clients start using these types of cases, the funding that grows because someone goes, oh my gosh, I've never heard you talk about it this way. And board members say that. And all of a sudden, yeah. the first gift paid for the entire case. And here we go. So yeah. it is, it's really critical. Well, it, this is really, Aaron, this has been an amazing opportunity to chat. Um, we have somebody that has written in from Kenya who says, I want someone to work with me and guide me here in Kenya. <laughs> Do you ever, Gee, and we're going to put your information up. Uh, they deal in climate change um, activism, which I mean, wow. in Kenya and certainly in Africa, we know this, this is a, a guiding issue for for the continent um so Aaron, do you work out of your community do, i mean I do. yes i have clients all over so uh i i love meeting new people and hearing what's going on in everyone's local community or the area where they serve so yeah i love it well Aaron straza chief donor strategist check out her site Aaron Straza, S T R A Z A dot com. And you can learn more about Aaron, her work, and her approach as to how she does this. Um, once again, Sherry Kwam Taylor, man, you are such a wonderful connector. Oh, my uh, goodness. She yeah, you brought us. Thank you. This, yeah, no, you do a great job at that. I, I'm, it's one of the things I love about you, one of the many things. But I love that we had this conversation. And um, I love to, Aaron, that you kind of reframed this for me mm. because I had a different, um, I don't know, definition. Yeah. yeah. Well, I so appreciate that you had me here. It was so fun to talk with both of you. Oh, Thanks, a Aaron. lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. You know, everybody, as we end each and every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we leave with a simple message. And as I always, I say this probably like four times out of five shows a week, but <laughs> it means something different to me each and every day. And uh, today 
I'm thinking about making investments in ourselves mm -hmm. and and the health of our organization. And I think this case for support really is in that vein. And so the message is very simple. It goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, ladies. We'll see you back here another.